Toby O'Hara is the Implementations Manager for the University of Western Sydney. He's got his fingers on the pulse of their metadata store and he's going to show us a bit about what's been going on under the bonnet. And I'm hoping he's going to provide his thoughtful insights into the pros and cons of working collaboratively and anything else he wants to say. I'm now going to hand over to him. Let's see. So I've been doing this for about a year, and I think most of the folks on this call have also uh, been doing uh, metadata stores and, and um, sort of wrestling with um, how to meet the not only the metadata stores project requirements, but also uh, how to really embed uh, some of these new things into the university. Um, I've had the benefit of uh, working with Peter Sefton, and so he, he's he's obviously very clued in with uh, um, all the issues and, and where things need to go. Um, and then um, through him, we also have the benefit of you know being intimately. Um, uh, intimately used to um, Redbox and Mint. Um, uh, the, the first thing that we did, and I think this was from day one when the metadata stores uh, contract, when we were putting up our hands, and this was before I arrived, I was, uh, I, I was actually brought on board right at the very beginning, but, but in all of those planning stages, uh, the university uh, internally, and I think you know collaboratively as well between, um, say, um, uh, Peter and, and and his contacts, um, there was this distinction, or, or maybe a rebranding of the term metadata store, and it was rather than talking about the metadata and and and, and putting it into sort of a, a storage of metadata. Um, at the university, we've rebranded it as a research data catalog, and I think that this brings to mind, at least for me, it brings to mind uh, as a kid going into the library, and there would usually near the front door there would be these um, uh, sort of these these little sliding um, catalog files, and you you slide out um, say. A through C, and and you're looking for an author, and so you you look through the little cards, and then on that card it would say um, where the book is that you want, uh, or the author, and, and and what books they've written, um, and so that's that's a way that at least UWS think about the metadata store. It's it's um, it's a it's a catalog with entries. So the, um, I, the, the, the pictures that I grabbed for this was basically a, you, you got a pile of data and the, the, whatever the data set is, it's, it gets a catalog entry or a record or in, in my case it was, you know, again, thinking metaphorically um, back in the um, sort of olden days, you'd get a card, you know, a new card that represents whatever it is out in the library space. And this would allow me to go then, then, then go and find that book, or go and find that uh, publication, or, or in this case, uh, go find the the, the data set. Um, and uh, I've got another. There, this is to the record. Um, for the for our particular metadata store project, we were building on um, work that was already done by the library or sort of done in tandem, really, um, work to seed the commons. So the, the seeding the commons project was, was started just before. And um, so basically with their efforts uh, of outreach and, um, as, as the name implies, seeding the commons, uh, getting, getting a few data sets that um, could then be, you know, used as examples. Um, in the, the sort of the next logical step is to strengthen the flow of how the the new entry is constructed. So um, this is I, I'm I'm not the expert. But this is this is sort of my very basic high level understanding of a, a, the anatomy of a catalog entry. And uh, actually, Simon mentioned earlier that uh, I should double check whether or not the slides are changing. Are, are the slides changing? Okay. 
That's fine. Is yeah. everyone seeing uh, a puzzle? Okay, excellent. It's all good. Um, but, but, yeah, so a single entry in the data catalog, uh, to my mind, is uh, sort of constructed of pieces. And um, you, can, you can see that in the Redbox application. I know not everyone in the, um, in, in the ANS uh, metadata stores are using Redbox, but Redbox is um, our example. Um, but the, it, it's, it's tabulated, so obviously you can, you can grab the different pieces of, of what actually makes up the record. Um, we also, uh, I think one of the um, key um, benefits of using Redbox in our case uh, was that the, the name authority provides some of those components in a reusable way and a consistent way. So um, every data set, when a, when, a, when a record is or a new entry is created about that data set, um, you can grab the, a person and, and when that person is attached to the, the record, uh, anything else that that person is associated with will then also um, it will display the same way. That that person will show up the same same way. Um, and so there's there's a few components on the screen. Um, metadata store specifically, uh, sort of over and above our seeding the commons efforts. Uh, specifically, we work to get um, as much data into that name authority as we could. Um, so we we. Um, set up the process and procedure by which information came out of our research management system, which is a homegrown system. We're not actually using uh, Research Master, but uh, it's a homegrown system and we've, we've got that process documented and, and sort of refined so that we know how to get information from that system into the Mint, which the Redbox can then use. Um, and uh, we also did that for activities. Um, we also uh, spelled out how uh, other activity type information such as FOR codes and um, national grant information can then also be put into the Mint ready to go so that when it comes time to create a new record about a data set, um, the, 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 the plan is that these bits can be uh, easily grabbed and, and attached. The other component was, and, and this was a requirement for the metadata stores for us, and I think for most, um, the ARDC party infrastructure, uh, which means linking out to the National Library of Australia. So again, we defined the process, how that was going to work, how we would, um, uh, you know, basically documenting for ourselves the, the procedure that um, borrowed documentation that ANS have already created around um, performing matching within the National Library of Australia's uh, Trove application and also just doing the checks inside of Mint to make sure that um, that link, that, that bit, that extra puzzle piece comes into the collection record. Um, to, to then have all of that ready to go in Mint uh, is intended to uh, sort of reduce the, the amount of time or processing that's required when uh, a new data set comes in and a collection record is needed. Um, and you can see there, I've, I've got a little asterisk, uh, just a disclaimer. Uh, this is a very simplified diagram, but I think it gives um, it at least gives you some idea of um, uh, grabbing different pieces and, and sticking them onto uh, a record and and then obviously putting that out. So just to sort of reiterate, our metadata stores was really about the mechanics of the system and improving the gears, improving the uh, flow and, and the process. And um, in my conversations with other collaborators, for example, um, especially those universities that have adopted Redbox, um, I think it really is more about um, <coughs> the implementation of the mechanics and, and the implementation of the processes and procedures so that the team uh, that, are, that are interacting with the system uh, do have a clear sense of, you know, 
where the process starts, um, what to do, and, and where the process finishes. Uh, and then, of course, um, in each case, the integrations with various systems have to occur so that the process works. So as you're crafting the process, you'll notice that um, you want to be able to do the next step. Um, but at the same time, it's imperative that in order for that step to occur, uh, some other problem has to be solved. Some other system has to be adapted or um, or if that system can't be adapted, then some adaptation needs to be made in-house. Um, the other thing, and this is this is tied again to making sure that there's information into the, the Mint uh, component of Redbox in, in the name authority. Um, we developed in-house, and this isn't on the slide, but we developed in-house uh, a way to view the ingested information, an individual ingest, when it comes into the Mint, um, a new entry is created on a, on a new view. So we've created a view that um, lists uh, each time that an ingest has, has been brought into the system. Um, and so we had, we had an in-house developer. Um, you might have seen his uh, comments or responses on the Redbox um, distribution. Uh, that, that's Lloyd Harashandra. And uh, he's done a great job. He's, he's, so this, this is actually available on GitHub as well if anyone wants to sort of preemptively uh, take a look at it and, and um, pull it down and, and, and patch it in. Uh, we have initiated a, a pull request so that hopefully it gets into the, the chunk functionality of Redbox. Um, but as I said, it, this was a new feature and, and, and I thought it was quite key to um, be able to see what um, what and how many uh, records are coming in to the Mint and, and what updates are, are occurring so that um, if, if anything isn't uh, registering or if, anything, if any new information doesn't make it in, uh, we'd be able to look at the report and, and see whether or not those records are being updated. Um, so that's, that's sort of the mechanical work that we've done just on, on the metadata stores. The next thing I'd like to talk about is the sort of logic context. So at UWS, uh, as you know, um, Peter is, is very collaborative in his approach. Um, and we also took a slightly holistic approach um, with the metadata stores project. I was actually brought in to um, implement the research data repository and so inside the large hat of the repository was this smaller hat of, of um, the metadata stores. So I had to get, get my head around sort of both and, and understand the distinction, um, the deliverables associated with the, the ANS requirements and then also the larger deliverables uh, of the university. Um, I think that that was actually uh, a very helpful approach to it. Um, not only was it integrated with the larger agenda, but it was also part of the um, technology needs of um, the, the components that would be feeding in or, or components that maybe don't directly feed into the data catalog, but um, as a system, will enhance the, or, or maybe you might say, <laughs> increase the possibility that uh, we would see more data sets, we would see better uh, data management pl planning, and uh, ultimately we would see um, the, the reuse and, and the integrity of the data you know, basically go up. <laughs> um, also part of the setup was uh, within UWS, we created a steering committee, and that was actually not not through my efforts. Um, that would be uh, largely through the efforts of Peter Bajaya. He's a intersect um, our intersect liaison here to UWS. Um, but essentially, bringing together the major stakeholders and uh, getting them in a room on a regular basis to report on the progress of the RDR, the Research Data Repository, report on um, the metadata stores, seeding the commons, and also our data capture, as well as some other projects. And 
just having those people in the room interacting with one another, understanding um, where any um, difficulties might be, uh, being able to not only escalate issues or, or stoppages, but also um, to be able to communicate with um, the group when, when there is a success. And then that, those successes can then be carried on to their various organizations. Um, the, in, in forming the steering committee, there was a lot of thought around what would these different players uh, actually get from, um, from various e-research projects, essentially, from the research data repository, from the metadata stores. Um, and we spelled out, uh, actually Peter spelled out, the, uh, some of those key benefits to stakeholders. And it's on our e-research blog. Did the screen just change? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, anyone can go to this. It's, it, it's a public blog. And um, you can get updates about what, um, what's going on with us. Um, and on this particular entry, this is sort of an early entry uh, regarding the RDR, and as I mentioned, uh, the, MS, the, the metadata stores is inside of that. Um, so we talked about the stakeholders and what, what those stakeholders would you know, receive or what we could do for them. And obviously at the top of the list is researchers. Um, they're, the, they're really the reason we're doing all of this. Um, we want to create a safe place to put working data, so that um, that's the storage component of what I do. Um, we want a, a, collab uh, a platform for collaboration around the data. Uh, that's, that's also very critical. And specifically on the metadata stores, I think um, this is well understood, but I'll go ahead and say it. Uh, you know, collaboratively reusing data um, being able to find old data so that it can be handed, you know, handed to someone who's interested. Um, I've heard stories where you know the the data is quite old and it's it's been placed somewhere. It's on a thumb drive somewhere, but um, not sure where. And and despite the the best efforts or the the um, you know goodwill of the researcher who created this data, if it can't be found, then it, it's much more difficult to share. Um, archive storage. So you'll, you'll notice there's a, the top bullet talks about working data, and then um, in the third bullet it talks about archive storage. So we've got working storage and we've got archive storage. Um, and and we're, we're really pushing forward on this concept of um, working with the data, but then at um, reasonable intervals or at, at key stages, um, basically moving that into archive. Um, a platform for describing and advertising data sets, that would be the data catalog right there. Um, a platform for publishing open access data. Uh, again, with the, the, one of the strengths of Redbox is that the, the data can literally be uploaded um, while the collection record is being created. So electronically, it, it can simply be attached to the record and um, it can be marked as open access. A platform for protecting confidential and trade secret data. Now, on the flip side, uh, just because a record is created in the, in the catalog, and, and I think this is, this is going to be an ongoing PR campaign with researchers. Um, when, a, when a collection record is created, it at least gives um, everyone, it, it gives to everyone the opportunity to ask about the data set um, but doesn't necessarily release the data to them. Um, so being able to protect anything that, that needs to be protected. Um, direct connection to scalable computing resources. And that's, this again is um, just within the, the data repository component but um, the computing resources are obviously very key uh, to be able to generate um, answers to, to big questions. And, and then uh, this, I think this is the most difficult one, saving the, the, the most difficult bullet for last, and that is minimal extra work. So trying to get them to change what they do or change how they're trained um, onto something better um, without creating more work and more hassle. So that this, 
this gives, I, I think reading this, being able to uh, see this on the web, anyone can then uh, realize that UWS are, are taking a, um, we're, we're biting off a big chunk and we're, we're really taking seriously all of the different components that um, need to come together, uh, not just metadata stores, but a variety of components that need to come together to create uh, a solution and a service that researchers will you know, naturally gravitate towards. Um, so that's, that's um, so not only have we integrated metadata stores project-wise, but we've also integrated um, different pieces of the university into a steering committee um, and we try to address um, how those different pieces are really going to benefit from what we're doing. Um, I'm sort of just marching right through this. I, uh, I hope, hope everyone's following okay. I don't know if there are any questions at this point, but um, I think I think one of the I think what Simon said about collaboration this this is where collaboration was really key um, not only on the steering committee level but also on a technical level uh, because within the data repository um, we had a lot of integration to the library to information technology services um, to the our office of research services and we ha we asked them to do things we asked them to create new services make changes to their forms to um, create new processes and new procedures. Um, and, and as that happened, um, that's where we saw success. Okay, moving on. Um, so then, not only do we think about how we can collaboratively uh, issue new uh, processes, new tools, new new collaboration opportunities, and and new ways of obtaining data sets to put into the catalog. Um, we we've given some thought to how can we tap into the research lifecycle. Where where are some natural breakpoints? Where are some um, triggers that would then you know, somehow uh, incentivize the researcher to start taking advantage of all of these uh, great things that are that are up and coming. Um, you can, I'm just going to flick to the blog once again really quickly. Um, you can read through the uh, words at your leisure and uh, at the same time there's some pretty pictures in Plants UML to make it even more clear. Um, the first one is a library-initiated data deposit. So again, the Seeding the Commons project, uh, there was quite a bit of work from our, our library staff, um, Susan, who you know, Yui, uh, and also Amar and Amir, uh, who you might have seen on the, um, the red box distribution list. Um, and this one's a bit more ad hoc. It, it's um, it's agnostic of any other trigger. Basically, we're, we're starting with a, a very sort of spontaneous uh, scenario or use case, and um, it might even equate to a cold call in, in, in some cases. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and um, borrow Susan's story and Yui's story um, at this point. This is really more of a seeding the common story. Uh, it was to do with the link with our steering committee and my understanding is that in the early days of seeding the commons, uh, reaching out to the individual researchers and saying, hey, would you like to try this new cool thing? Um, it, it didn't have a lot of success, but being able to go back through the steering committee and go back through um, the, the PBCR, um, the Pro Vice Chancellor Research, and ask them to sort of nominate some people and, and maybe butter them up a little bit and say, well, your, your research is exceedingly important and, and we'd love to um, be able to work with you and, and, and preserve this extremely valuable data set. And just, you know, being able to uh, send that message from the PVCR 
uh, it really beat a path to the researchers in, in a much more effective way. And um, Susan was able to get more engagement that way. So we were able to get data sets. Uh, and then the metadata stores also uh, definitely benefited from that. Uh, the, the same engagement was continued and uh, some of those data sets were sort of um, pushed through under the C in the Commons, C in the Commons finished and there were still data sets coming in. So uh, we've definitely seen success with a, you might say, library initiated or even sort of ad hoc university initiation of you know, nominating individuals and asking them for their data sets. Um, just to sort of quickly walk through, so let's say we search for candidates in the university systems, so in our um, research um, tracking uh, research management system, um, finding who those uh, research and researchers are, asking the researcher directly, um, you know, is there any data that you would need later or you need to archive or, or you need to cite or, you know, any any sort of carroty marketing type messages that, that we can, you know, potentially you know, send to the researcher to entice them to participate. Um, the researcher, of course, instantly obliges is, is completely, uh, uh, you know, besotted with the idea and, and sends their data set. Um, and then the information uh, around the data, the, the catalog entry is created, and then that uh, the, the data plus the entry goes into our uh, research data repository or specifically uh, into the catalog. So um, by, by representing the repository as a thing, it, it masks all the mechanics and the gears of this this bit is the storage, this bit is the catalog, this bit is working, this is this is archive and so on. Um, and then we looked at different ways uh, that maybe in a more uh, procedural or ongoing basis that we might start to see data sets come through and new entries to the catalog come through. Um, so in this case it's automated data capture. Uh, we, we do have a data capture project at UWS, that's the DC21, um, which, is, uh, which is going really well. And there may be other data capture. Um, most of you might be aware that we are cooking up a, a hybrid data capture ad hoc packaging service, uh, formerly known as the CLAW, now known as Credit. Uh, Credit is going to combine the benefits of data capture with um, the benefits of being able to do packaging uh, basically at any time. So at any stage in the life cycle, this packaging can occur. Um, a, a data set can be packaged up and it can be transferred into the, the, the catalog and the, and the data store. But this, this scenario assumes that a data capture application is in place and you know obviously we're not the first um, you know, data capture has been in place at UTAS for a while uh, there they have research centers that that send um, in, you know data collection records on a regular basis um, and, and, and there are other universities around the country um, but but this is uh, not not as ad hoc as cold calling a researcher and asking them for their data uh, this one requires a bit more planning in advance and it also um, assumes that it, during that planning, uh, the life cycle is considered, okay, so um, the type of data we're generating, the, the frequency of the data, the, the volume of the data, all of those things are considered, and then, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a setup where the data capture is set up, it's implemented, uh, the, the switches are configured properly, and, and data simply flows in nice, neat, and tidy packages. Um, so again, not not tied to any particular part of the life cycle, uh, except for the fact that uh, generally it would be at the beginning of the research. Then um, we've also had scenarios where the publisher, uh, a journal or um, you know any any publishing activity, the publisher says, "Oh, you you got to." Um, you got to have your data in a in a place that we can, you know you can cite it and, and it's it's persistent it's permanent so that's pretty self explanatory and typically this would be towards the end of uh, 
a research cycle, a paper's been written, uh, or, you know, potentially, uh, the researcher already understands that the publisher is going to require this, you know, the, 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 the magazine that they're targeting has already been very, you know, public about, oh, you know, we're, we're going to definitely need some you know, proper data deposit and citation. Um, and, and potentially that researcher plans ahead. Um, but the actual bundling of the data, creating a data set, making the deposit, um, would probably potentially occur at the end. So again, tying it to the life cycle, trying to plug into a natural spot where researchers um, would naturally want to provide a data set and, and, and make that available. And then, um, again, part of the life cycle, uh, uh, grant, uh, applying for a grant or, or at least commencing the grant. Um, I have talked to researchers where, you know, the, um, the grant application process can be quite long and bumpy and no guarantees that anything is going to come through. So we do have to work with um, the, you know, the possibility that, you know, there's, there's long gaps of time, there's, um, there's some damage control when it comes to, you know, how, how much effort am I really going to put into this before I know that it's going to happen. Um, but all of that aside, it makes sense that when a grant is, you know, if, if I'm a researcher writing a grant, I strengthen my application um, by saying, you know, I, I know exactly what to do with my data. Uh, I know uh, I've already planned for what's, you know, where it's going to be deposited, where it's going, how it's going to be deposited, uh, who's going to take care of it, and, and how it's going to be cited. So, again, this scenario is something that we can present and we can say, here, just copy and paste this into your application and we will help you execute. And then uh, also tied to grants, um, obviously when the, when the grant is finished, um, the actual data deposit needs to occur. And so assuming they've done all their planning and they, they've signed up to this, um, a data deposit occurs at the end of the, when the project is finished. So the reason I bring up the life cycle um, as part of our metadata stores, there's another, um, there's another scenario before I go into that reason. Um, reporting driven. So if the university needs to be able to report that we've, you know, that, that the university is, has generated this much data, the university is, is um, playing well with others, uh, the data is available, um, or, or even just sort of building that reputation of really taking care of researchers. Um, we want to be able to report on that. And so uh, in, if the publications need uh, to have an entry or if the research management system, for example, the ERA portfolio, if we want to be able to put that into our um, ERA portfolio, then this is another trigger that we've identified that would encourage data, um, the deposit of data citations. Um, so, as I say, re read through this uh, whenever, um, whenever you have the time, and we hope that this generates more discussion out, you know, outward, so that um, these triggers can be, uh, you know, recognized, uh, planned for, uh, adopted. <clears throat> But the reason I bring that into uh, a metadata stores discussion is because, um, as I've said before, we're, we're taking a holistic approach and not only do we need to sort of see metadata stores as a project by itself, we need to see it succeed and we want to, you know, fulfill our obligations, but also uh, to, be, to be able to see the larger projects succeed and to be able to accomplish the ultimate goal uh, of, you know, naturally plugging into what the researcher does, um, we need to recognize where those sort of intersection points are, where the where the um, natural triggers are. Would you like to just um, talk about the pros and cons from your perspective? Some of the some of your reflections on those collaborations. 
Let's see. So, well, let, let's start with the pros. I always, I, I, I am naturally a half full type person, and it's it's been a massive, massive benefit to have um, the the collaboration on the software component specifically. Um, I think it would be really difficult in my mind to to separate. ANS objectives and ANS deliverables and ANS requirements from the solution that we've uh, implemented, which is Redbox. Uh, and it, it really gives our university and, and other universities like Newcastle, it gives us something concrete that we can point to and say, uh, we need this to work well. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it gives... Um, it at least gives a point of discussion that says, okay, well, you know, I'm trying to implement this process, and if there's if there's a software feature that's already been put into the software, um, then it's it's fairly easy to just point to it and say, well, just implement this, and 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 you've got your problem solved. Um, as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, it's not only the software, and it's not just the um, mechanics. But it's also the procedures and the, uh, we don't quite have a policy, and I think that's on purpose. Uh, you can discuss that with Peter Sefton. Um, but it's, it's the policies and procedures and the, and the sort of organizational change uh, at the university that's, that's even more important. And while every university is different, and each university has its own challenges, um, I think there's still there's still room for collaboration and, and, and sort of collaborative discussion around the challenges of reaching out to the right people, uh, the challenges of um, being able to make headway, essentially, and um, what, what kind of messages might fly better than other messages. Um, so there's, there's that. And, and I, I would also say that, uh, you know, because we have a strong, um, somebody who's already been involved, we've got, you know, Peter, uh, he's also technically savvy, and uh, when we brought our own, um, our own programmer, uh, that was, it, it, I don't think it would have succeeded as well without Peter's technical background. Um, Tony, the, would you like to talk specifically the other, about the collaboration that you've been engaged with? Yes, certainly. Um, what, what, what have you been trying this. to do? Yeah, um, the one of the features that um, was developed by the University of Newcastle was the um, reporting, uh, having some better reporting inside of the Redbox software, and um, we went out with sort of our intention to improve the reporting. I, I wanted, as I, as I mentioned before, I wanted the, um, to be able to see when data had been ingested into the Mint. Um, and so Vicky at the University of Newcastle, she um, included that and as a feature. Um, and and we, we actually talked through that, and, and, and I, thought, I thought that was great. Um, it, it, you know, it's... It's just a classic case of many hands making light work, and we could then take our resources and, and, and invest in, in say something else while that's being developed. Uh, so that was very positive, and it was I would say it was it was great to work together on that. Um, then, not in a negative way, but I would say then it, it just so happened that the the being able to see the list of ingests that we were after, um, it, it didn't quite make it into the um, upgrade that the that Newcastle had um, put together. Uh, so it was just as well that we were still proceeding with um, our version. Um, so collaboratively speaking, uh, I would say if there if we had had a real dependency then I would have had to make changes to try to adapt um, because that feature didn't actually make it into uh, the reporting 
that um, the University of Newcastle created. Um, so our sort of list of the ingested data, it, it, it has a different look and feel and it's not really inside of the new reporting module that's in uh, Redbox version 1.6. So there's, there's the, I would say, there's the, the communication was very good and of course as soon as, as, soon as something changed, um, Vicky called me immediately and, and you know, explained the situation and we, were, you know, we, we worked with that. Um, Collaboratively speaking, however, uh, we, we, were, we were still in a good place because uh, for the metadata stores, one of the optional deliverables on our subcontract was to provide reporting. And, um, and, and we basically got that deliverable for free. And, and it was, um, again, it was sort of reporting about the what's in Redbox versus um, what we were doing, which was the just the uh, having a report related to ingested information, um, ingested metadata, and um, so there was there was definitely uh, a massive benefit in that we didn't have to um, do we didn't have we didn't have to go to a lot of effort to get the deliverable. Um, and then there was just the, uh, I guess, the the changes as well. So you're you're sort of at the mercy of of, of changes to the the plant functionality. Um, if you know if there are if if there are any changes going on with um, the other organization, and um, if if it's beyond your control, then that that creates sort of a follow-on effect where uh, if if we hadn't had something that we could go to, then we would have been stuck to to actually create that feature. So your advice to others engaged in, in collaborations from your experience? What's the key to making it work? Um, Oh, Toby, I've lost your sound. How about now? Yeah, that's I think I bumped back. something. You're back. So we missed your okay. answer to that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so let's see. Uh, the My advice, I, I'm, not, I'm not one for handing out advice, but um, what I learned was that, uh, first of all, there was a real trust and it wasn't necessary to formalize. We didn't have anything formal, um, and I don't think any of anyone in the community has anything formal written down that says, "Okay, we agree that um, this feature is being developed by you, and we agree that you know there will be massive problems if it doesn't happen." Um, so nothing formalized, and I think that was that was not a bad thing. On the other hand. Um, by not having it spelled out, then you're then you you're definitely in a in a trust uh, scenario. Um, I want to say that the the best approach is um, well, from my perspective, and this is more about style. Uh, from my perspective, I I prefer to just roll with it and and um, if we hadn't had a backup plan, then I would have created one, basically. Um, so, I'm, as you can tell, I uh, I don't I don't really have um, advice for collaborative development um, because I, I simply enjoyed the benefit without having to um, work through. Um, the the difficulties that I had were not were not insurmountable. Terrific. Well, um, hopefully there'll be some questions coming in. Can I uh, either use the chat box, um, Amanda? It'd be great to hear from you, uh, or unmute yourselves and and ask ask. 
OB. Toby, um, while we were just waiting to see if there are any questions coming in, um, your, the, the project at UWS is, is beginning to wrap up now. Uh, what are your sort of thoughts on it as, a, as, a, as an instrument of change at, at UWS? I know that it's part of a, a bigger picture and you've covered that. Um, but we spend a lot of time sort of reflecting on, on just how these metadata stores pro projects are having an impact on the universities. Uh, is there anything yeah. you want to add to, to what you've already said? Well, um, maybe I could just sort of build out uh, the concept of making it easy for the researcher um, and also I would say making it easy for the, the, the supporting environment. So um, within our library team, being clear about you know, how and when uh, to you know, address research data. Um, making that, that kind of clarity I think is invaluable, and I would I would strongly urge any university, any e-research team or library team that are um, implementing their metadata store. That's that's one of the key success factors. I think is to to make it very clear how things are happening. Um, you know, create that recipe, if you will, so that things proceed the same each time. Um, and that, as as that clarity emerges, it then becomes so much easier to explain it to other university stakeholders. This is how it works, and with that clarity, they you know all of a sudden it's not so difficult. All of a sudden it's very doable, and then with that clarity, it's also easier to explain it to um, researchers. So um, to get back to your question, you know, the project itself was about greasing the gears. Um, making the clarity uh, more apparent, making it, making, um, making as much explicit, uh, as many things explicit as we could, so that um, the the path is you know that much smoother, and it's it's going to be easier to follow the next time and the next time. Um, we really are taking a long view, and we're we're. Um, basically saying, okay, this is going to happen um, over the long term and by setting it up in a clear and, and consistent manner, uh, we can then start to make improvements. So the, the, the core capability is, is, is set up and it's, and it's as smooth as it can be and as easy to do as, as, as possible. Uh, and then from there, it can only um, get better and improve with, say, more automation or um, increased, um, you know, flexible um, input or, or any of a number of things. Thanks, Toby. There's a, a question uh, from, uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's Mary White, who appears under the name Maureen McCarthy. Um, if, Mary, if you've got a microphone, would you like to unmute and ask Toby? If not, I'll ask it for you. I'll, I'll pause for a moment. I don't think Mary's got a microphone, but what, what if her question is, and I, and I think I'm going to put a couple of words in front of it, um, are the, what are the benefits of M, M, MS23, your metadata stores project? Uh, she's, she's written the benefits of MS3 being incorporated in institutional repository projects. So I think it's yep. what benefits here. Yep, um, that, that's a very good question. Um, first of all, infrastructure-wise, uh, you know, holistically speaking, we looked at the infrastructure needs of the metadata store of the of the red box. And so when we were planning to upgrade the storage, and when we were planning for some of the appliances that go around the storage, um, we were able to incorporate the needs of the data catalog. And um, at the same time, looking at you know where data is going to go ultimately, um, making space, um, making sure that certain technology was 
was available to plug into. Um, and that's just the infrastructure component. The other component, um, the we actually moved the uh, IT services piece. Uh, it, we well, not moved, integrated the IT services piece into the overall project. And so anything that um, that we needed for the metadata store from an IT services comp you know, perspective, uh, we then could use the um, services component of the overall project. Uh, and that component was to create a new service where needed and basically insert um, that. Um, and, and, and this more ties to, again, to storage. So we, we created, uh, for example, we created a new service around the storage and um, to be able to give working storage to researchers. And as an integrated part of doing that, we wanted to give visibility on that storage to the data catalog as well uh, so that it, it then makes it easy to grab the data and, and in, import it into the catalog, um, assuming that the data size was reasonable, um, where you know, most research data is, is not, not that copious. Um, so creating new service. Uh, not necessarily required by the ANS metadata stores, but because it was under the overall umbrella, um, we could then integrate any time that um, we were creating a new service. Um, I would also say that having the metadata store as part of the overall uh, RDR project, um, it, it, gave, um, it gave context to our steering committee, to the leadership, where they could see um, that it was it was part of a, a larger thing. They could see that this isn't we're we're not just it's not just an exercise um, to tick boxes. It's really an exercise to um, roll out uh, a new way of doing things and a, and a new sort of I'd say host of services that um, that then you know make the university better able to work with researchers in that sense. Thank you. Thanks, David. We're getting very short on time, and there are two questions you, you might quickly cover. Uh, one from, um, from Sharon uh, at uh, UTS. What platform is the repository based on? That's the, the repository side. And Amanda Nixon yep. um, has asked you, uh, Toby, could you please talk a little about how you work with your research office, especially when you're thinking of dealing with reporting? So you haven't got much time. See if you can cover those two. Well, the first one's easier. We uh, it's it's running on Sun Solaris. Any other questions there? Um, the 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 next one is that um, yeah. So our our research office have been fantastic, uh, just in the sense of whenever I whenever I talk with them about processes, data management, especially, and um, well, as, as a concrete example, uh, we asked them what forms and um, grant applications that we used for our internal grants, and also um, we asked them what forms were used to um, basically set up a new research project. So uh, a researcher here would come to the Office of Research Services and they say, oh, I, I, need to, I need to get started and I need, I need to write a grant. Um, and, and they were able to bring out those forms and they were able to say, absolutely, let's work, let's work together on inserting some language around you know, data management. Uh, so that was, that was quite good. And um, they, they've just been very cooperative. I, I don't think, uh, I, I can only say that the, the, any, any walls or any obstructions must have been beaten down before I ever arrived. Um, but they're very cooperative. The other concrete example is within the uh, management system that we have, um, we've got a, a systems engineer who is, is very willing to, he, he's made suggestions that um, are, are essentially, you know, we can, we can implement triggers, we can implement reminders, we can implement uh, different things into the system that would then trigger researchers to participate and um, get involved and, and, and think about their data. Um, and so that's, that's, it's, there's just been a real willingness um, to discuss. And I don't know if that's just because of um, you know, it, the, the relationship must have been very good to begin with. And, and it could be because of the link to the steering committee, again, because um, 
with all of these sort of senior people eyeballing each other and sort of daring one another to blink first, um, they, can, they can essentially um, send that, that message, the, the impression of cooperation through the team. And so anyone I talk to, uh, they know that the head of Office of Research Services is on this committee and they agree with what we're doing. So we get that cooperation. Thanks, Toby. Look, um, we're just running slightly over time now. I just want to thank you very much for, for your time and that presentation.